We'd like to begin and welcome our panel. Uh, both uh, Judge John Gleason and Kathleen Williams are intimately familiar with the Defender System. Uh, I welcome uh, Chief Judge Ada Delgado, and I've heard many things about the District of Puerto Rico. Looking forward to hearing more from you. And then Judge Bill Matthew, and Magistrate Judge Bill Matthew, my old uh, trial partner from 20 some years ago. Uh, so. With that, uh, we'd like to begin with brief opening statements from each of you, and then we'll move on to the committee for questions. I'd like to begin with Judge Gleason. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks to this committee for two things. One, inviting me to speak um, and to be questioned. And second, for doing what you're doing. It's very important work. Couldn't be more important work, as far as I'm concerned, within the judiciary. When I first became a judge, like happens to all of us, I got a, a memo asking whether I wanted to be a member of a judicial conference committee, and if so, which committee or committees I'd like to be considered for. And there was a, a list of the jurisdictions of the various committees, and I had been a a federal prosecutor for 10 years, was into that work. So I put down the criminal law committee on the first line. And then on the second line, for reasons I can't even remember, because I still, have, to this day, have no idea what the federal state jurisdiction committee does, but I put that committee down. And then on the third line, I said, if I can't be appointed to one of those two committees, I don't want to be appointed to a committee. So naturally, Chief Justice Rehnquist put me on the Defender Services Committee. <laughs> At the time, I was a hard-nosed, uh, organized crime prosecutor. And if you made two lists, one list, the uh, defense attorneys I liked and respected, and then the second list, the defense attorneys I had successfully moved to disqualify from the trials I tried before their unethical conduct, that second list would have been a longer one than the first one. So when I came on the committee, I was ready to uh, ride herd over the defenders and the panel attorneys. And it took me about a minute and a half to figure out that the defenders and the panel attorneys had been ridden herd over for a long time before I arrived. And what they needed more than anything else is protection. Stewardship, yes, but mostly protection from hostile forces within and without the judiciary. I don't believe in, in making policy by anecdote, but I do think there's anecdotes that can be illustrative of systemic problems, and I want to share three briefly with you in my opening remarks. One is when I was chair of Defender Services, a district judge to whom a recently filed capital habeas petition had been assigned didn't have an attorney who could handle it. So that judge reached out to our defender program and inquired as to whether we could find one for him, and we did. There was a defender in a capital habeas unit in another circuit who had just had a case resolved and had the capacity to handle this capital habeas petition. Through the death penalty folks in the program, we notified the judge. The judge was happy. That defender was appointed. And about three weeks later, I got a call from the chief judge of the circuit in which that case was pending. Not even asking, basically directing me to unappoint that capital habeas unit lawyer. And uh, I told the chief judge I couldn't do that. I hadn't appointed the lawyer and couldn't unappoint him, but asked why. And the answer to the question why was there were plenty of uh, law school clinics within the circuit that would represent death row inmates for free, including in the capital habeas setting. Uh, I push back a little bit. I care about defender services. I push back and explain that, you know, the prosecution functions in national program, when I was, uh, when Joe Hartzler got appointed by Janet Reno, to investigate and prosecute the Oklahoma City bombing. He called me, I was a prosecutor at the time, asked me for some good people, and three of the people who worked for me doing organized crime work in Brooklyn ended up on those trial teams out in, in Denver before Judge Mage. I explained to this chief judge that 
The judiciary is a national program too. As, as the need surfaces, we have lending and borrowing districts. District judges and circuit judges go around to help one another out because it's a national program. And try to explain that the Defender program is the same thing. It's a national program and it's not only not a bad thing to have uh, to use the resources from one circuit to provide, to answer the, fill the needs in another, but it's actually a good thing. And the answer I got to that from the Chief Judge of the United States Court of Appeals was that it violates the principles of federalism for a federal defender to go from one circuit to another to help, to help uh, prosecute a federal habeas petition. The second anecdote I want to share with you is, is the effort that went into section 230.36 of the Guide to Judiciary Policy when I was on Defender Services Committee. That's the provision of our guide that says a judge should give notice and an opportunity to be heard to a Criminal Justice Act lawyer before cutting a voucher. I was here yesterday, I heard some discussion about this as a possible idea. We already have this guideline. When we got it, I thought, at the beginning, I thought this is a no-brainer. You know, no, we're judges. Notice an opportunity to be heard is our middle name. We don't adjourn a trial without giving somebody an opportunity to be heard. And it seemed to me at the time that, you know, you take a $20,000 voucher and you cut it to 10, that's somebody's livelihood. Where do we get off not giving notice and opportunity to be heard? But I was shocked at the pushback, at how ingrained it was. And it wasn't, it wasn't really the judges on the committee as much as it was the judges reporting back the uh, reaction of their colleagues and their, where they came from, each one judge from each circuit. Um, the resistance to having even just a phone call phone call that says this seems excessive. Anyway, we, we prevailed, we, got on, we had to water it down, had to make sure that it could be informal notice and an opportunity to be heard, didn't mean you got a hearing, God forbid, you get your voucher cut and you can't pay your bills, you get a hearing, we watered it down. But the, the point is, it got promulgated. Um, and my main point in, in raising it is, is to, it's of a piece with, uh, with the first and now the third anecdote I'm gonna give you. And the third one is very simple. It's, you know, you go to a lot of national meetings of defenders and panel attorneys when you're involved in defender services. I certainly did. And after Booker was decided in January of 2005, there was a panel attorney who wanted to, sorry, a defender, who wanted to provide training to the panel in that defender's district about the post-Booker world. Those of you who were on the bench then, and even if you weren't, will remember there was a good deal of confusion as to what was coming next, what weight would be accorded the guideline range and the like. And this defender went to the chief judge in his uh, district and asked for a list of the panel attorneys and contact information. So the panel attorneys could be invited in for training. And the chief judge's response was, I'm not giving it to you, that's proprietary information. And these are just three anecdotes that, to my mind, place in very stark relief that a systemic problem, and the systemic problem is there is insufficient respect in our own ranks, in the judiciary's ranks, for the uh, defender program and for panel attorneys generally. And you know, one thing that, one thought that occurred to me yesterday, and it wasn't the first time it occurred to me is, like many of you, I do a lot of panel, I do a lot of CLE trainings. People ask me to show up, I show up. And unless they're mandatory, and they're only some of them are mandatory, I get the same impression each time as the, the lawyers show up for training. And the problem is the people who need the training the most aren't the ones that come to the training. You know, the ones who you really need to be talking to never show up. And the parallel is you've, good for this committee and you're having these seven public hearings and it's great. I know you're hearing things that, that are revelatory to you and will help you. But I think 
one problem is the judges who really need to hear what you're going to hear aren't here. And they wouldn't have signed up, and they're not going to care very much about what you're doing. And we need to be ever mindful of how many of those judges there are and uh, how important it is to, to create policies with them in mind. The last thing I want to mention, and I'll, I'll, I'll end, is a process point. And, and I think this is so important, and it's a, it's a consequence of the demotion of the program and the, its director within the AO. Um, before the wood got laid to the defenders during the sequestration, I was asked to be part of a conference call with uh, the chair of the executive committee of the judicial conference. The other participants in the call were the chief judges in New York, Southern, Eastern, and the chief judge of the circuit. And they asked me to participate because I had some familiarity with the issues by virtue of having been involved in defender services. And a main topic in the conversation was whether the shortfall in the defender budget ought to be dealt with by requiring layoffs, by taking the having the defenders share the pain. That's a, a buzz phrase for, that we'd heard for years that uh, meant requiring the defenders to have layoffs and fire people. And it was a, wasn't the, wasn't the first time the issue had arisen. It arose every time we had a shortfall. And the logical answer to that is it doesn't make any sense to do that because everybody knows, the chief judges know the defenders have been well scrubbed for years. And if you make them lay off people, they're going to go to the chief judge and tell the chief judge, I can't do these representations. Those representations go to the panel, which is more expensive, less quality, more expensive. And uh, so it doesn't really save any money. That argument won the day for a decade. And those of us who were involved in defender services saw what was happening, what was going to happen coming around the bend a mile away. And on this conference call, there was us in New York, and then in, on the other end of the call was the chief, was the uh, chair of the executive committee, and then a staffer from the budget committee. And when you do this stuff long enough, all of you, I'm sure you do, you know, you, rec you, you, you recognize talking points when you hear them. And the talking points that we heard were the talking points that we had been getting from the budget committee for a decade. And the most remarkable thing about the call to me was there was no one on that call from the staff, from the Office of Defender Services, no one there from the Defender Services Committee. A decision that went right to the heart of the function of Defender Services was being made with no input whatsoever from anybody who knew what was going on. So the process, you know, the, I think process means so much, not just for appearances, but for the quality of decision making. And this demotion, this uh, degradation of, uh, of the Defender Services staff and the committee by stripping it of key, points, key parts of its jurisdiction is a bad thing. Really needs to be corrected. Just so the people who make the information, I don't fault the chair of the executive committee, he's trying to make the best call he could on behalf of his committee at the moment. But the information flow is defective when you carve people out, when you cut people out of the process. I've taken more time than I should. I look forward to answering any of the questions you have. Thank you again. Thank you, Judge. Why don't, why don't we go to the opposite end of the table and we'll go to Judge Matthewman for opening statement. All right, thank you. I'll be. Um, very, very brief. Um, I've been involved with the CJA uh, program since the 1980s versus a CJA attorney. Um, I was a uh, district representative, district CJA rep, 11th Circuit CJA rep, and I was the national CJA rep for two years and uh, have handled everything from federal capital cases in the federal system to all types of other cases. Now, as a magistrate judge, I deal with um, defenders and court-appointed lawyers on a, on a daily basis. Um, first of all, I think that uh, Congress got it right when they passed the Criminal Justice Act. I think it's a model for indigent representation. I think it particularly runs well in our district, in the Southern District of Florida. We had, uh, in the last fiscal year, we had 
2,324 defendants, 2,324 criminal defendant filings. I'm not exactly sure how many of those were represented by the public defender. I'm sure that information can be obtained, but I know last year approximately 989 were represented by CJA attorneys. 989 out of the 2,324, and the public defender had an awful large number. So the great majority of cases are represented by uh, either CJA counsel or federal public defenders or system public defenders, which I don't think is something that was anticipated when the Criminal Justice Act was passed many, many years ago. It's a reality that our system could not work without the Criminal Justice Act, without, without the CJA lawyers and the federal defenders who do an excellent, excellent job. Um, however, I think the program can always be improved. Um, I believe that, um, for example, in our district, we, ha we have a, a, a list of attorneys who are up for appointment uh, each week in each, each division, and the lawyers know that they're ready to be called for appointment. They have to be available to immediately meet with the client, and we get fairly prompt representation that way, and I think that's a good uh, system to have. I think mandatory training and more training for CJA attorneys in conjunction with the Federal Defender's Office is very important. I think that the panel um, qualifications should be, uh, should be high. And I think there should be mandatory training. And if the attorneys are not willing to go to the training, then I think that uh, their membership on the CJA panel should be reconsidered. Uh, and I think that's because the law changes so, so, so uh, often. And as Judge Gleason said, oftentimes at these seminars, the lawyers who show up are not the lawyers that need to be there. It's the lawyers who don't show up, which is why I think uh, the mandatory requirement would be, would be helpful. And that can be done in conjunction with the federal defender. Uh, I believe that there are caps that are too low. For example, private investigator uh, hourly rates and caps are, are too low. Um, in order to get a qualified private investigator to, to handle a very serious case, uh, sometimes it's difficult, especially in a district like this, to find an investigator who will work for the lower hourly rates uh, and, and the low cap. So I think that needs to be addressed along with other hourly rates and caps of, of, um, um, of experts. But overall, in this district, I think we really are a model for a lot of the other country, and I think we have a very very good uh, CJA panel, a great federal defender's office. I know I sit on the CJA committee for this district, and we have more attorneys um, applying to be on the panel than we do have spots. So we have to go through a winnowing process, and we require an application, a uh, detailed application, and there is a vetting process that we go through in order to have attorneys appointed to the panel. And, and I think all of that helps raise the quality of of representation. So I'm willing to uh, and happy to answer any questions that anybody um, on the committee uh, may have. I think a lot of problems that used to exist back when I was the national representative and the circuit representative with uh, low attorney hourly rates and, and, and low caps and things of those natures have been ameliorated somewhat. They have been helped somewhat in recent years. Um, and I, and I do think we, we need to get on to other issues as well, such as I've said, training and things of that nature. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Chief Judge Delgado, can I turn to you next? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the committee for the opportunity of sharing here with you some of the experiences that we, and measures we have adopted in the District of Puerto Rico to address uh, some of the issues related to the panel. And my statements here today certainly are based uh, on... Judge Delgado, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you pull the microphone in front of you? Our, we're streaming this and it's not picking up, apparently. Okay. Let me backtrack then. <laughs> okay. Uh, of course, that I welcome the opportunity. And having been here yesterday, I saw the work that was being done during the afternoon hours. And uh, certainly need, the work being done needs to be commended in the sense that uh, those are hard working hours in a very tight schedule. And I think that uh, the purpose and what is in agenda uh, deserves of that effort as well. For that, I thank you. As I was saying, uh, my statements here are based on the data that we have gathered for the district. I'll try to refrain from anecdotal uh, uh, comments. Uh, and certainly based as well on my background and experience and direct involvement with the CJA panel attorneys and the federal defenders. 
And by way of background, I should mention that I began in 1982 as an assistant federal public defender. That's how I began uh, to work for the federal court and the district of Puerto Rico. And there I held several positions, including the one of acting federal public defender. And those were in the years and times in which the federal public defender used to manage the panel of attorneys. And as to that, I'll have some comments as well later on. Later on, I was appointed as a magistrate judge, served the court as a magistrate judge for 12 years as well, being a member of the CJ panel committee. And back then, I participated with the chief judge and other members of the panel in drafting the CJ plan for our district as 1995, 2004. And then appointed to the bench in 2006, also uh, directly involved with the CJ panel committee and as the chief judge since 2011 as well. I chair the committee of the CJ panel, the CJ panel committee since for the past nine years. And the friend's work, I must say, is very close to my heart. I recognize the importance of the job that is being done by Defender Services, the importance of the CJA, which I think is a well-structured statute uh, that with fine tuning and uh, collaboration and, and direct communication and maybe the national guidelines that were being mentioned and discussed yesterday, uh, a great deal can be achieved. Uh, so the district in Puerto Rico in particular, uh, except and taking away uh, the numbers of Puerto Ricans who have decided to move to the district of Florida, uh, right now the population is of 3.4 million and is served by uh, one district court uh, with seven active judges, three senior judges, and four magistrate judges, an office of the federal public defender with 20 attorneys, uh, and of course the staff that was mentioned here yesterday, and a CJ panel of attorney that has 87 members uh, to the present day. They represent a wide variety of cases, among those drug gang conspiracy cases, RICO, weapons, fraud, child pornography, immigration, which is among the lowest percentages now, different than what it was in the 80s, and a large number of death penalty cases. The panel attorneys are receiving between nine, an average of nine to 11 cases per year, which I think is a good number that will ensure the sufficient proficiency of the panel participants. And many of those cases in which they participate are multi-defendant cases that at least may uh, take a year to complete to the trial stage. In terms of the caseload, I think that the District of Puerto Rico is among the first in multi-defendant cases and is seventh in the nation in the movement of prisoners. And I, I, you'll, I'll give the reason why I, I highlight this because uh, we are among the border states, but actually the movement of prisoners that we have uh, is related to violent offenders as well, as you will see, because our caseload is 45% of drug gang cases, 25% of weapon cases. Uh, since 2011, there's a M MOU with the state authorities that, uh, through which, in order to curtail the murder rate and violence incidents in Puerto Rico, an average of 450 cases are being brought from the state courts into federal court. Those are weapon cases because of the interstate uh, commerce. And these people do have a recidivism rate between 60, 50 to 62%. Many of these cases are going into the hands of panel attorneys. We also have a 10% of fraud cases, and of course this is complicating the, the, the scenario for panel <coughs> attorneys in terms of time consuming cases, and a larger number of death penalty eligible cases. Between 2012 and 2014, the district tried to penalty phase four cases, uh, and it took $5 million from the CJ budget. And at the same time, uh, we had on pretrial stages 35 eligible death penalty uh, individuals. And uh, what I would like to point uh, and ask to the extent that it's possible that this be considered as well in recommendations to Congress and the Department of Justice, is that there was a huge delay in, in, in terms of the time that it took the Department of Justice to make the final determination as to certification. Uh, our numbers indicate that it was taking between one to three years, and those cases may have uh, consumed four to five million dollars of the CJ budget before a final determination was made. 
Uh, as to September of this last year, we had four cases with 17 defendant death penalty eligible, and by January of this year, it has turned down to one case, but with six defendants already certified. I think that the recommendation for Congress and the point to be made is that fairness and due process, aside from the need of efficient management of scarce resources, should lead to a revision of the statutory framework for this type of cases and for a more streamlined process in which to handle those. Uh, sometimes when we informally talk about this, we discuss that if DOJ would have had to pay for the pretrial cost of uh, the pretrial stages of this, they would certainly have a better, uh, uh, an increased interest in streamlining the, the process. But that is taking a big chunk of CJ funds uh, aside from the fact that I think there's, uh, everyone should be more sensible to the fact uh, that these cases put a lot of emotional burden on not only in, on the defendants and their relatives, but also on the victims, uh, and the victims' families as well, and in the community in general, more so in a district like Puerto Rico where the state prohibits, by the Constitution prohibits the death penalty as well. Uh, and of course, Having those cases for so long in pretrial stages affects the case management that is handled by the court and the performance of the attorneys and imposes an undue burden on CA funds. In terms of workload, we have a massive number of vouchers uh, of cases, uh, defendants being charged. We had, for example, in between 2014 and 2015, consistently over 700 cases filed. And uh, in those 700 cases, we had over 1,400 uh, defendants being charged. In 2014, for example, we had 26 multi-defendant cases involving 594 defendants. Per se, the multi-defendants produced the 40% of our defendants' workload. Same thing happened in 2015, in which in 16 cases, multi-defendant cases, we had 465 defendants charged. And of course, the panel has 85 uh, members. Right now, it's been sufficient uh, to handle this workload. But there was a time in 2012, 2013, in which we had to look outside the CJ panel uh, to get attorneys appointed to this type of multi-defendant cases. Uh, when I mentioned that we are seventh in the nation in trans uh, mo prisoner movement, I would like to uh, mention that the detention center that we have uh, has a maximum capacity of 1,200 defendants. Since 2012, we have exceeded that. That has produced the need to house pretrial defendants in Atlanta, which means out of the district, out of the direct reach of defense counsel. That is not the optimal scenario in which the court would like to see cases being handled. Because of that, the court has uh, had to manage and work a system with the U.S. Marshals uh, in having video conference systems available for the attorneys, uh, of course, at no cost, and, and having some of the internal policies and probation work done in advance of these defendants being transported out of the jurisdiction. Uh, and still, we recognize that there is a need under such scenario to pay for travel, for waiting time at the detention center, and we have tried to work through uh, with the CJ panel committee and all the district judges methods that will try to alleviate the burden imposed on CJ panel of attorneys, like allowing them uh, through the courtroom deputies to know and a listing that prevails where the defendant is at a given time, uh, access on a given basis when they ask for appointments for the video conference system to be available, given frequent notice through e uh, massive emails for them to know uh, what is happening in every single circumstance that may affect their daily work. Uh, I agree with uh, Judge Matthewman in the sense that the CJA structure and the Defender Services uh, certainly is uh, a well-developed and implemented structure that provides for quality services. Any issues as to funding, I rest assured this committee will be addressing in as much I have seen a consistent uh, statement being made as to the need for increased funding, given the increased cost of litigation and services. But I'd like to emphasize, and I think that the judges in my district, we remain uh, w cognizant of our duty to ensure effective legal representation to de develop the defender's program, 
and to promote uh, professional growth of the attorneys and members of the bar. And we remain committed to that. We are aware of the need to strengthen the quality of the legal representation being presented. And if anyone is going to say that the court exercises control over the defense bar is to demand quality services and good performance in court. Uh, actually, uh, something that I don't know if has been made in any other district, but in September of 2014 was the 50th anniversary of the CJA. And uh, we held a public recognition of the CJA panel attorneys, the CJ, uh, public defenders, and uh, CJA representatives. And actually, one of the things that we took care of was to make sure that every attorney received a pin to wear so that they will feel pride on the type of work that they do and will carry it as a distinction of the quality of services and group to which they uh, belong. And I think it's an important component uh, uh, of, the, of our legal system. Uh, in terms of expert services and representations being made, I don't think that any judge will second guess request for services. I'm a firm believer that having a good defense attorney as well as having a good prosecutor makes the trial judge work easier and better. And we don't have to be so much concerned about uh, being gatekeepers because everyone is doing what they are supposed to be doing and we know what our work as to that is. In terms of panel attorneys, uh, I would like to mention that in the 80s when I was a member of the Public Defender's Office, uh, the panel had 100 members, and those were the times in which the Public Defender controlled the appointment and designation of attorneys. There was a case the magistrate judge called, and uh, a name was given from a three-tier system that we had, attorneys from uh, one to five years of experience, tier one, tier two was from five to 10, tier three from 10 and above. And the recommendation for appointment was directly made by the public defender's office or the designee. And that system was later objected by panel members because it was very subjective and resulted to be unfair in its application with same attorneys getting more frequent appointments than others was not balanced. And currently, the panel attorney's uh, designation or appointment is done by a random computerized system. Uh, this system has been largely favored by panel members. Of course, the judges do remain with the authority to make a direct appointment, but there's a, a need to make uh, written findings under such circumstances, this to ensure the transparency of the appointment process. Um, I think that reverting the control of the CA panel to the federal defenders, in my opinion, is not advisable, not for the selection or designation of attorneys, and certainly not for the vouchers review. I think that even if an independent structure is created, then that will be the way in which it will work. But still, I think that it's important that the person reviewing or the entity reviewing the vouchers needs to have knowledge of what has transpired in the case and not to have a conflicting opinion, and I think that while uh, funding remains within the judiciary, uh, judges should be the ones reviewing and are the ones in the best posture to understand the complexities of the case and the quality of work rendered by the attorneys. As to, I agree in terms of what Judge Matthewman said in terms of the qualification of panel members, there should be strict requirements. I think that our district plan requires, uh, sets the, the bar high, five years of experience, and uh, showing an interest in the criminal defense. Those applications for uh, membership are closely scrutinized by the CJA panel committee, which by the way is con uh, composed of four fixed members, the public defender, the clerk of court, a magistrate judge, and the chief judge or the designee, and five attorneys of which at least three must be CJA panel members. Uh, now there is a revision uh, in place that we expect the district judges will approve and finally the circuit that we commence that once this application process is favorably considered, the attorney be appointed for a year. What we want is to have a cushion of a year to see and be able to evaluate the attorney's performance and see if he, he should be reappointed for extra three years. This reappointment process uh, now is structured in a way in which it involves an application for reappointment, uh, peer review by CJ panel committee members in which uh, we take from each of the attorneys, we review and try to review from the electronic docket, motions practice, quality of the motions, performance in court, 
and we get the input in general for the attorneys being evaluated by session from the district judges, and that input is transmitted to the panel committee who takes that into account at the time of deciding whether to recommend reappointment or not. Generally, recommendations for reappointment or uh, not to reappoint are favorably considered by the court. Uh, the court gives deference to the work being done by the panel committee. Of course, those that are more closely evaluated are those uh, that involve removal, which we haven't had uh, except one many, many years ago. We have a mentoring program that has undergone reviewed in a couple of occasions, and now it's been restructured. We have mentors identified by the court. We have from 10 to 12 attorneys, plus the attorneys at the Public Defender's Office who act as mentors. And when we say that the court appoints them, we do not look for people that will just please the judges or the court. We have experienced litigators that do challenges. The judges are uh, respected practitioners. And uh, actually, that's what we would like to see in the bar. As to training and so forth, I know there will be questions, and I'll uh, leave that for afterwards. What I would like to mention is that certainly uh, and that we have a large number of vouchers that are being reviewed on an annual basis. Most of those, of course, are attorney vouchers. Uh, for example, in 2014, we reviewed 1,434 vouchers. 76% of these were attorney's fees vouchers. In 2015, same percentage. And 85% of the vouchers that we reviewed, uh, we just took a sample. Uh, and actually, when the work of this committee began, and we knew there was uh, anecdotes in terms of uh, members failing or talking about excessive cuts or averaging, I asked the clerk of court to take the period of uh, given period, and they took from March 15 to November of 2015, and 641 vouchers were reviewed. Of those, 85 percent were vouchers over the maximum amount, and that's generally what happens given the large number of multi-defendant cases. What happens in our district, and the average number of vouchers being filed per month uh, is from 109 to 120. And we only have 2.5 positions of CJ clerks. We don't have a CJ administrator. So a lot of work is being done with extra support from the finance department. And I think that the shortage of personnel is something that needs to be looked at. And, and if we are uh, to ensure prompt payment of vouchers, and given the number of vouchers in the District of Puerto Rico, we are in need of additional personnel. Uh, the First Circuit Court has taken measures to ensure timely payment of vouchers. For example, in March of 2015, they have required quarterly reports on any voucher that has been pending from filing to the to payment for more than 90 days. And actually, I, in order to make sure that we were in compliance, I took the precautionary measure of demanding that the clerk's office will give me uh, 30 days reports. That means every district judge that has a voucher pending for close to 30 days, I received that report in advance of the 30 days so that I can make sure that compliance is achieved and that serves as a follow-up. So that measure is also being implemented. But the policy of the circuit requires at least 30 days for every stage of the evaluation process for vouchers over the maximum amount. Yesterday, there was a question concerning whether the circuit had taken measures uh, uh, times of sequestration. The first circuit did. There's a series of uh, recommendations that were made and uh, were implemented and remain in place in the district. And that includes, uh, uh, the, and it's submitted uh, within the materials that I gave, uh, the grouping and, and the way in which to build for electronic notices. And once again, we have to keep in mind that we may have uh, cases with 4,000 electronic notices or more or entries in a given case. Uh, also, presumptive rates for uh, certain type of experts, like paralegal investigators, mitigation experts, and health experts, and strict application uh, of uh, administrative guidelines pertaining guideline review. I will say that in terms of voucher review and voucher cuts uh, within our district, I, those remain at a minimum. If we take the same sample that I described at the beginning of the 671 vouchers reviewed, 
84.5 were over the maximum, 104 vouchers or 15.5 were under. Uh, the time in which those under the maximum vouchers were reviewed ranged between 13 to 16 days, and that's from clerk's office to getting out of chambers. And for those over the max were to, from 24 to 28 days. Uh, I think that most of the adjustments uh, being made relate and are based on applicable guidelines. Uh, there might be a few that may produce controversies. For example, there's a guideline that says that uh, collateral matters like uh, handling bail documents and things are not to be uh, reimbursed, but actually defense attorneys understand that if you go to the clerk's office to assist the relatives of the defendant to post bail, that's just a, uh, something that is beyond the legal duty or beyond what is considered reasonably necessary in the defense of the case, as if you, the attorney goes to the registry of property to get copies of the deed, certified copies of the deeds that are to be posted. So that type of things uh, that are kind of, there's ambiguity as to how to apply that may bring a controversy here and there, but I don't think that's significant. We comply strictly with the notice and due process that is to be afforded by counsel, and I think this is an important aspect in which all circuits should be required to do that, and all districts as well. I think uh, <clears throat> it's proper. And what I have seen is uh, many motions and many vouchers that still, in spite of training and repeated training, still do not comply with what is required in terms of giving the proper explanation and justification. Judge, can I ask you a question about what you've just said? And I'm sorry, normally we don't in, in, in opening statements, but I think this is a, you, you've hit a very important point. Uh, do, your, do your statistics reflect the percentage of vouchers of that group of vouchers that were cut over that period of time? Yes, they do. And actually, uh, act from, uh, from we did a, a sampling of 1,212 vouchers in which 102 had judicial adjustments. Okay, that's an 8%. Within that 8%, and we were not able, and we are still in the process of, since the e-voucher system is being upgraded and still implemented, of narrowing down and breaking it by, by different uh, grounds for the adjustment. We have those in which there were mathematical mistakes, there could be averaging, or there can be a simple cut based on a given reason by the judge. Uh, or maybe including improper or not proper justification. So it's an 8% across the board, including cuts and, av and averaging. <coughs> I'm sorry to have interrupted you. I know that, that you know, there are going to be others who have a great deal of questions about this particular area because it's one we've gotten to. Um, and I know the questions are something that, that uh, we want to get to. So let me, if you can finish up and then we'll get to our last opening statement and we can get to these questions. Okay, so aside from that, uh, what I would like to mention is, and probably I'll wait until we, uh, there are questions, if there are questions on expert services. Uh, but that as well, uh, I think that there's a need for education and for attorneys to get uh, develop awareness on how those expert services can be used more so as to the mitigation sentencing phase. Uh, I think that within the cases that are presented in the district, as I was sharing this morning with some of you, there can be somehow a caseload explanation as to why our percentage remains low in terms of use of expert services. And it is, if you take that 45% is drug cases, in many, many of those cases, <coughs> Mr. Mackelman knows, we have a large number of audio recordings, video surveillance, large number of cooperators. Uh, in those videos, almost 98% of the defendant's charge, you have a zoom of his face, you have a zoom of the plastic bag they are carrying, of the, the money being counted right there. And the type of testimony that is presented usually is a chemist. And there are so many ways in which you can cross-examine a chemist on whether that was drug, was heroin, or was marijuana, whether that was cocaine, I'm sorry. And, and then when you go to the weapon cases, which is 28% of our workload, what we have, the expert goes, is generally a law enforcement agent, as to whether the weapon is capable of firing. Uh, in most of the cases, we don't have issues of fingerprints. So we seldom see that issue coming up or the need for an expert. So if we talk about whether the weapon is capable of use and being fired, now the government is taking a video recording of the testing, which is presented in the case. And, and I don't see the defense attorneys asking for another expert to rebut that. 
unless the methodology is totally mistaken, which they take good care in making sure that it's not. Uh, so you have 28% there, you have 50, almost a 50% in the other side, you have almost 70% of the cases in which the same technology that is used by the government is just blasting and overwhelming. So for sentencing, I do see a need, and I have seen an, uh, uh, a need for expert services that probably could have been better used to convince a judge of a, a reason for a variance or mitigation. In the death penalty cases, of course, then the story is totally different because we have the mitigation specialist, we have all of these people being brought on board. Uh, of, I think that around 50% of what is uh, ex the expert services in death penalty cases are for mitigation specialists, and the other largest percent will be for investigators. And I don't see, and I haven't heard from the CJ panel committee, or as a, in my individual character as a judge, complaints about uh, an attorney saying, I was denied my request for ex expert services on whimsical reasons given, uh, of a judge. Thank you, Judge. Uh, so Judge Williams, do you have a brief opening statement? I do, thank you, and good morning. I do want to thank um, this committee and all the staffers for agreeing to do this very, very important work. I was impressed by the long day you put in yesterday. I was uh, startled that Mr. Khan told me I had to be here at 8.30 <laughs> and that you would have another long day, but that actually put me in mind of a story that Brian Stevenson tells, who is the head of the Equal Justice Initiative about meeting with Ms. Rosa Parks. And Ms. Parks wanted uh, Mr. Stevenson to explain what it is you're doing there. And Mr. Stevenson was explaining about how he intended to represent people who were accused of heinous crimes and make sure they got due process and try to avoid unfair sentencing. And he went on for quite some time and Ms. Park said, all of that's going to make you very, very tired. But that means you have to be very, very brave. I think as a committee, by the end of this process, you will be very, very tired. But I think the things We're you- We're already tired. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was right, and you can credit some of my testimony as we go forward, Great. that you will have to be brave and I think bold because I believe the reason I'm here is my history with the Defender program not only as a defender but as the chair of the Defender Advisory Group and as I said in my testimony I have a concern um, as to the future and most particularly the identity of defenders and CJA lawyers and the absolute need for respect for the independence of their function. I, too, want to give three brief illustrations, as Judge Gleason gave, um, of instances that, as I said in my testimony, always startled me as to how people in the system could not understand the work. At one point, uh, there was a discussion of defenders sharing with probation officers, secretaries, and computers, because we're all part of the same court family. It took longer than I had expected to go over privilege and confidentiality, and again, independence. And then there was an effort, and I think Judge Gleason was aware of this, in a circuit to mandate that you would only get one trip to see your client, only one would be paid for. I, I met with lawyers and judges from all over the world, and they were always, by the end of the meeting, awed by the fact that 
this government, the United States, would pay people to stand up and challenge it. And so I think that any effort you can make to ensure that that system, that example, that beacon of constitutional guarantee can be maintained, then you will have done your work. But you will be very, very, very tired. Um, I am open, obviously, to any questions the committee has about my experience with the defender system. I, I do want to echo what Judge Matthewman and I believe some of my now colleagues said about this district although I don't want to say too much and sound too self-congratulatory because I was the defender for a long time here and I worked with people like Bill Matthewman to develop the protocols we have. But I don't think, I think that's aspirational. I think there are considerations nationwide as Judge Gleason has said that need to be redressed. And I'm hoping that this committee will take up that task. Thank you, Judge. Uh, we'll start on the outside and move in. Can we start with Judge Goldberg on my left? Uh, thank you, Ruben. <clears throat> I want to uh, ask a few questions of Chief Judge Delgado and pick your brain <laughs> on this concept of whether CJA representation should be viewed as pro bono representation and to what extent. So we've reviewed, I've reviewed a couple circuit opinions um, where voucher cutting was challenged. I forget procedurally how it made its way to that circuit, but it did. And the circuit courts, I think there were two of them, wrote opinions that are frequently cited justifying voucher cuts because the circuit court said, after all, this is me paraphrasing, uh, after all, CJA work is pro bono work. Um, in, in your statement that you submitted, um, you said, the Criminal Justice Act also makes clear that legal representation under the CJA panel carries a pro bono component. Thus, the act makes clear that it will not be reasonable for an attorney to expect rates as those possibly paid to defense attorneys in private practice. So very early this morning, I went and took a look at the CJA Act, um, and I didn't see any reference at all in the act to the statement that um, CJA panel representation carries a pro bono component. But I was bleary-eyed, so I asked our, our legal counsel to double check, and she confirmed that there's no statement at all um, in the act that talks about the fact that CJA lawyers are obligated to look at this as pro bono. So I was wondering, um, if you had any concerns about the concept of telling CJA lawyers that they're expected to, in some degree, I'm not sure to what, but in whatever degree, act as pro bono lawyers to whatever extent. And I'd like to hear your thoughts as to whether you have concerns that that theme could somehow um, detrimentally impact uh, proper representation for indigent defendants. Okay. M maybe my statement was misconstrued in terms of I was not necessarily attempting to quote from the statute, but actually it has been uh, amply discussed and mentioned and it's perceived and actually that's the, the way in which our, even our CJ reps and, and CJ panel attorneys, uh, uh, the philosophy behind this is that of course, in private practice, you may have attorneys charging 200, 350 hours, uh, dollars per hour uh, when they are privately retained uh, defense attorneys. And what we have here is under the statute, uh, uh, certain cap amounts have been imposed, revised through the years. Uh, and 
to the present stage. There are some who still think it should be 150, others understand reasonable is 140. But the perception is that it, the statute per se, the work of these attorneys who are providing services to the court, it has a pro bono component. Whether it's uh, because of the fees that are being paid that are perhaps under what privately retained counsels would charge, or because not necessarily every single effort that they put into the case is compensated. That's why the guidelines per se uh, have embedded the pro bono system, because not everything that is being done, even by a solo practitioner in the office, is necessarily subject to reimbursement. So in terms of the, of the, the way in which attorneys perceive that is, they understand it has, to that in, in that sense and that view, a pro bono component. But at the same time, when reasonableness of the cap is being discussed, I know that uh, there are periodic review, or regular reviews, I should say, sorry, uh, of this cap. And some may think it's still unreasonable, and maybe if 150 is the reasonable amount that has been determined or is subject to extra reviews every two or three years, uh, uh, honestly, I don't have a view, a fixed view on that. What I do know, based on what I have seen, is that still the amount being paid, the attorneys do favor it. And uh, in my district, in the District of Puerto Rico, Fa favor. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm favor, sorry? favor what? We say the attorneys favor it. I wasn't following. Favor uh, what? Well, accept or recognize that doing work even for that amount is something that they choose. Their attorneys, and every day the largest percentage, are making a living of CJ panel work. They have abandoned their civil practice, they have abandoned the state criminal practice, and, and technically all they do is work under CJA. And we have a larger number of those within the CJA panel of attorneys. So aside from that, uh, as I mentioned, I don't have a view on what should be the cap, if any. Uh, I think that whatever, if there is a cap, what I understand is that there should be a sway, leeway for the attorneys to justify a need to exceed uh, the, the cap that is imposed for the cases, and here I'm talking about maximum amounts, and, and to be able to explain to the court why the services rendered need to be reimbursed and provide justifications as they are allowed to do right now. Have you seen instances of voucher cutting where judges justify voucher cutting on the concept that CJA work is pro bono? Because that's, that's exactly what happened in the circuit cases that I I haven't I seen much of that. I have heard from prior testimonies that something like that is being done. I, that's one of the areas in I, which I think judges need to be trained and made clear that there are guidelines and there should be a more consistent way in which those guidelines are to be applied that will provide uniformity through the, the different circuits and through the nation. So the, the current rate is $129 an hour. Um, your written submission indicates that uh, you believe the current, you say the current fee appears to be reasonable. So continuing to sort of harp on this pro bono theme, do you have any concerns that with a $127 hourly rate, you don't think it should be raised to 150, that uh, when we add in a pro bono component to this, it's going to be more difficult to attract uh, competent counsel, because you have to factor in, of course, um, and I haven't done criminal defense work in a while, but you have to, of course, factor in overhead and, and, and all of that. So if you do the math, I mean. I'm not sure you're understanding your question, because the pro bono component, I think it's embedded on the fee already fixed, which is not the one that most commonly, uh, attorneys commonly in the private practice will charge. And I'm not saying and, and taking a fixed posture in that 129 or 127 is the right one or 144 or 150. What I do say is that to the extent that that is being regularly reviewed and, and the review is carried out to adjust that properly, then there are some guarantees in there for the attorneys. Experience-wise and based on that in our circuit, we have more applicants to the CA panel than positions. Same thing as in Florida. So there must be something that is attractive, either the type of work and the devotion or interest of that given attorney in defense work, or uh, still, uh, it doesn't create an economic hardship as anyone or many other people may think. I don't know what the reason is. I do know we have more applicants than positions, and I do know that many attorneys nowadays are making a living in my district, once again, I say, uh, out of CJ panel. Okay. Ruben, I have a, a quick question for Judge Gleason, and then I'll, I'll uh, 
turn the mic over. Uh, Judge Gleason, first, let me congratulate you on an incredible career in public service um, and ask you um, a quick question about the due process component. You cited, um, I guess, a, a policy statute, I forget what the number was, where you said there's been a lot of discussion about there has to be due process with voucher cutting, but that is already in place. Um, and it is, you're, you're certainly right that it is in place. So I'm wondering, could you give us any guidance, if you have any, on how do we get, and I think you mentioned this, how, what do we write, what do we recommend, what do we say as a committee that would actually get our colleagues to one, take note of that, and two, actually implement it? I mean, I can picture sitting around the conference table with my colleagues and some of them, you know, I'll say, well, I'll raise my hand and say, well, I just want to bring this to everyone's attention. And most people nod their head and there'll be a couple of people who will go, oh, I'm aware of that. I don't have to follow that. I can do what I want. I'm an Article Three judge. So could you give us some guidance if you have any on how we could enforce that, so to speak? Sure. Being one not to read the emails that come from the AO on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, I recognize that an email that apprises us all of a change in policy doesn't necessarily do the trick. But there are other ways to do it. You know, there are FJC educational programs. We have circuit conferences. Every year, a lot of districts have their own district conferences. If we really care about getting the word out as an institution, there are any number of avenues to do that, to sensitize people. We could, um, the Defender Services Committee could do a better job of, of and I, you know, I was chair of Defender Services at the time, so shame on me for not doing a better job of having the members of the committee <coughs> educate the, their colleagues as to policy changes like this. But there's, if we really mean it, we can get the word out. It just, I hope that answers your question. Just briefly, let me just express a different view on this pro bono uh, matter you raised with uh, Chief Judge Delgado. The, a basic tenet of any system that purports to deliver independent, well-resourced, uh, quality, indigent defense services has to be, it cannot be in any, in any dimension, pro bono. It should be anathema to any such system. For, for one thing, pro bono who? Whose bono is it pro? Publico? Is it for the good of the public? <clears throat> Fine, but we're appointing people to represent defendants. It's for their good. Now, the logical extension of this pro bono notion was that district in Georgia that comprised its panel of, of uh, anybody who happened to be a member of the bar. You went on the panel. And a bankruptcy associate from a, a firm came to the judge and said, I, what? <laughs> I'm a bankruptcy associate. The person's life at liberty is at stake. I can't do this. And the judge kicked the person off the bar of the court because he failed to do his pro bono publico service. We have to keep in mind whose, whose interests we're preserving here. And it's not the public's. You know, a trial may be a search for the truth, but the defense lawyer is not part of the search party. <laughs> you know, we have to keep our eye on the ball. The, and the fact, I don't, we all, I say this with all respect to Chief Judge Delgado, but in New York, we get a lot of applicants too. But that rate attracts the wrong people. <clears throat> we get bottom feeders. You know, we get people who can't get retained work. Our mission should be to the extent that a, a piece of what our current panel attorneys are doing is pro bono, that should be an argument to the legislature to raise the rate so that that's no longer true. So we get the right people on the panel. Judge Prado, do you like the question? Uh, yes, to, to, to follow up on that question, uh, Judge Gleason, you, you were the, the chair of Defender Services. Judge Williams, you were a public defender. Judge Delgado, you, you were an assistant public defender. And uh, Magistrate Judge Mathisman, you were a, a panel attorney. All of you have had experience uh, in Defender Services. And 
I was here 20 years ago, and, and the same issues, the same complaints, the same concerns I'm hearing again. Uh, and, and here, 20 years later, we still have the issue of concerns about judges have, thinking they have the responsibility, or maybe they do have the responsibility of overlooking the program. Maybe some go too far, micromanage. Uh, deciding who is going to be the defender, deciding who is going to be a panel attorney, deciding how much they get paid, um, and, and is there a systemic problem? Is it in isolated areas where we need to educate our fellow judges about the importance of the independence of allowing defense lawyers to do their work? Um, uh, 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 that requires a more drastic change to, to how we work uh, of the defender services and defense work coming under the courts. Uh, should there be more independence? Or uh, is it just a matter of educating part of our judiciary about the importance of independence of, of uh, panel attorneys and defense lawyers in allowing them to, to do their work? I'll take that. Um, I do think, I do think that there is a an educational dimension of this. I mean, as as an active trial judge, as Judge Gleason alluded to, mostly if I see an AO, well, even when I was a defender, a, a memo from the AO, I'll hit delete because I am engaged in trying cases and resolving matters. But that doesn't mean the Defender Services Committee and this committee can't be more proactive in discussing the independence of the defense function so that these incidents are not raised again and again and again. And I think that goes to Judge Goldberg's question about how is it that this pro rono dimension became somehow affixed and affiliated with this work. I mean, I think I alluded to it by uh, mention of the, the, the stereotype of the client, but that somehow this work, it, it is easier to undermine it and denigrate it because of the nature of the work. And so this confusion that it is somehow pro bono. I remember when TARP lawyers from major law firms were being hired by the government at $550 an hour. There was a huge article where they, the TARP lawyers, were offended and outraged that they were being required to submit timesheets for the work they did. And there was a discussion about that. If a CJA lawyer wishes to know why his or her voucher has been halved, there is not a standard mechanism adhered to by which they can redress that. I think it's because of the nature of the work. And I think as judges, we have a responsibility to do something to educate not only our colleagues but the public as to the value of this work. I made some suggestions in my submitted written statement. Um, I, I think we need professionals engaged in the voucher process at the circuit level, at the district level. Uh, I think we need to think anew about a national defender program that's kind of a standalone, like the Sentencing Commission. But what is that, what is that phrase? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. We, we have to break away, do something, because the direction we are now going in and the fallout from sequestration, I think, was significant. Judge Prado, I'm with you. You know, I, I was on Defender Services for nine years. And I've never really drifted away from the concerns that arise repeatedly 
in that program, but I, my day to day brought me away from it. And then I sat here yesterday and I was listening to, to the conversation and it all came rushing back. I felt like I had post-traumatic stress disorder <laughs> there for a minute. But I think, you know, I, th I think your observation um, it basically points out that, you know, there, there's this built-in conflict of interest. We're doing, the we're doing the best we can. We're not doing a great job as, a, as an institution in delivering the services that the Criminal Justice Act um, directed us to deliver. But it's not a logical location for the delivery of indigent defense services. And the thing that struck me the most in my decade on that committee is how there was hardly any important issue that we addressed that did not somehow, that was not a manifestation of the built-in conflict of interest. That's why they keep arising, and they'll continue to keep arising as long as the apparatus remains the same. And as long as it does remain the same, I, I agree with the sentiments already expressed, which is, at the very least, we need to sensitize, sensitize the judiciary that it has this responsibility. It's any number of situations. Uh, Chief Judge Delgado reminded me of, a, of a, you know, when the chair of the executive committee said to the attorney general, would you please hurry up with these seek or no seek decisions? The defenders, as you might expect, if you think about it for a little bit, defenders went crazy. They're like, excuse me, they're gonna hurry up and seek if you make them hurry up. And I don't mean to suggest for a moment that the defender's view on all these different issues uh, should carry the day, let alone does carry the day, they rarely do. But should they be heard? Should there be some sensitivity among the judges uh, that, that run the branch to the fact that we have been imbued with this responsibility so we have to discharge it with the right amount of communication and the right amount of deference? Absolutely, and we're, we're not there, never been there. Actually, let me clarify, my intentions of streamlining process never far away from uh, getting them to basically certify. No, no, I, I, I understand no, no, that. I, and I yeah. understand, because I, actually I'm opposed to it in essence, right. and I think uh, culturally it has happened and has been demonstrated by the jury verdicts, and I think that Mr. Uh, Judge Matthewman experienced that in first hand uh, when he was a learned, acting as a learned counsel in the district, <clears throat> but actually, I think it's a, uh, if Congress is so concerned about adequate use of funding, that's a waste of, uh, of resources right there. Uh, and uh, processes under CJA are being severely affected by policies of the Department of Justice. And it's a matter of, if you look through different statutes, different issues, uh, and uh, even the rules of criminal procedure, they impose uh, a burden uh, as to the funding within CJA. Judge Walton. Uh, Judge Prado, I think that the issue comes down to where is the voice for the federal defender and the CGA uh, attorneys. I think, because um, I can recall back to the 80s and 90s when the hourly rate was just so low, it was absurd. I think it was 30 or $40 an hour. And mm -hmm. the only lawyers who were on the panel were really lawyers who were sort of true believers, lawyers who really wanted to do this type of work. Uh, and the hourly rate has creeped up and has, and has increased over the years. But the question, I think, has been, would the defenders and the CJA lawyers be better not under, not under the umbrella of the judiciary? Would they be better, I guess, having some independent seat at the table, and if so, at what table? I think, um, in my experience, the judges have been, the judiciary has been very supportive overall of, at least in our district and in other districts I've worked in, um, of the CJA lawyers and the, and the federal uh, defenders. The question, I guess, is, is there a better system? Is there a better way for the defenders and the CJA lawyers to have a, have a seat at the table, to have a voice into what's going on? Um, and I'm just not sure of that, but I think it's an important inquiry for the, for the committee to, to look at. Um, I think the last, over the last few years, the sequestration <coughs> problems have, have exacerbated these issues and, and, these, and these problems. Um, and I do think, in whatever format it is, uh, it is done, that I do think it's important 
for the CJA lawyers and the federal defenders to have a true seat at the table and a true voice in what is going on with the, uh, with the defender program. Mitch Walton, do you want to ask some questions? Very briefly. Um, you know, I'm always on board with the idea of education. I think education can change perspectives and also sign, trying to sensitize people about the importance of uh, the work that criminal uh, defense lawyers do. However, I'm not confident that that alone is going to be adequate to cause, unfortunately, some of my colleagues to not respect the role that defense lawyers play in the system. And I think, unfortunately, it's because many of us come from a perspective uh, where we've never been in a situation where we have had to need the services of defense lawyers. Uh, I was in the juvenile justice system three times. Two times I was guilty. One time I was not. I didn't have a lawyer on any of those occasions. And having experienced, uh, having been wrongfully adjudicated guilty of something I didn't do, it gives me a perspective that causes me to appreciate the importance of not shortchanging the role that defense lawyers play in our system. And I just feel that if we only continue to require that judges, if in their discretion feel it's appropriate to provide a form and an expression as to why they are cutting a voucher, I just fear that there's some of us, and I'll probably anger some of my colleagues, who just will cut regardless. And they'll do it indiscriminately, and they'll do it without explanation, and they'll do it without giving a form for people to express their opposition to those cuts. And I feel that maybe the only way we can do it, if it stays with the judiciary, and I think we should play some role, is that we mandatory require that judges, if you're going to cut a voucher, you have to articulate why you're doing it based upon guidelines that are uh, established for when you can appropriately do that. And I don't know if any of you have any views as, as, as to whether you think I'm off base. <coughs> Go ahead. I will agree. We are doing that right now. And I think that one of the problems is the lack of consistency throughout the districts in giving notice and giving due process to the attorneys and giving an explanation as to the voucher cuts. For example, when I hear that from districts in which that is not happening at all, or when I have heard the testimonies given in Santa Fe, taking and assuming as true and correct testimonies of some attorneys as to matters or issues in which they have been cut, I think it's, I'm concerned about that. But of course, that is what I, I don't see happening in, in my district. And still, there will be attorneys that perhaps will be, have questioning as to any cut made by a given judge. I am not saying that we are all 100% marching along the same guidelines, but we have uh, basically a, a, a coherent system in which it's being done uh, for the evaluation process. And, and even if there is a discrepancy maybe with one of the judges, still the notice requirement is there. And as was suggested yesterday by the colleagues here from Florida, maybe there should be a review process. There's precious time that is being invested in the attorney coming back with a written request for reconsideration to the same judge that already has a way of looking at it. Maybe at the appeals court, they should be taking it and have someone else review that for arbitrariness. And, and I will not be opposed to that. So yeah, I think that if aside from Consist, requiring a consistent application of the guidelines, training judges. I don't see why this cannot be part of the training of judges that the FJC conducts on a regular basis. That will promote uniformity, more reasonableness in the things that are being done. We learn from experience, and of course, this same experience in which different judges and different districts are sharing what happens is, is enriching, per se. And, and we can learn, and, and, and I think that the basis of all of this has to be mutual respect for in the independence in the job that is being done by each group. But this can be achieved by training and close communication between defenders, community judges, and maybe <coughs> inserting a review process, whether it's at the Court of Appeals or wherever the committee feels it's proper. I have two suggestions. If you assume, as I do, and your question suggests maybe you might, that we're going to stay in the current structure. Um, we're not going to make fundamental, dramatic earthquake changes. 
it, there's a little bit of a conflict when the defender reviews a panel voucher. You know, they're often in the same case. We've got the conflict that inheres in our own situation, plus this lack of sensitivity. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think judges or defenders should either be completely out of the picture. Um, the two suggestions are what we finally got promulgated was a, a guide, a, a manual provision that said a judge should give notice and an opportunity to be heard to a CJA lawyer before cutting a voucher. You can change that should to a must. And here's, a, here's another suggestion that I, I think, naturally, since I'm making it, I think is a, is a good one. Um, when we, we had this problem in Defender Services where when you look at the panel side of the house, 40% of the money, 2% of the cases were taking up 30% of the money. And the idea, and I'm proud to say, I take no ownership of the ideas that turned out to be lousy ones, but I had some good ones. And my idea was we should do these case budgeting specialists, and Bob was intimately involved in this. And they were placed in three circuits, I think. I think I heard that's now been expanded to other circuits. And these case budgeting specialists were designed to help judges in the big cases, the mega cases, through requiring people to budget their time, but also to make sure they weren't hiring <coughs> experts at an hourly rate that was excessive, that there was sharing. If there's 10 lawyers, each of them need a copy. Maybe we don't have to make 10 separate. You get it, to be more efficient in the big <coughs> cases. And it turns out the case budgeting specialist in our circuit, who's a former panel attorney, is actually used a lot in these, in what might otherwise be voucher cutting situations. You know, my colleagues will say, you know, I have this voucher, it looks a little uh, extreme, or up front they'll say, I have a request for an investigator, I'm not sure whether I should do it. I've sent them to Jerry Tritz, who's our case budgeting specialist, and he's been very helpful. You know, a lot of judges are, are leery about this for the right reason. They don't want to intrude on the defense function. Um, that, that former, the, who occupies the position strikes me as really critical. We chose a respected panel attorney, and it has produced a situation where uh, in a lot of circumstances that might have otherwise produced a voucher cutting, the panel attorney's happy, the judges are happy. There's this other third person in there that's, that's very useful. And it's the principles that inform why we did the case budgeting specialists in the mega cases and the capital cases are all the same. You know, it's all a matter of having some measure of uniformity and consistency and um, uh, they'd be pushed back from the case budgeting specialist to the panel attorney. Be que the questions can be imparted through the panel attorney at the end of the, through the case budgeting specialist at the end of the process if there's a question about a voucher. So it, you'll see this in my written testimony. I, I strongly suggest you consider that sort of mechanism down to the, 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 the granular level of the regular case, because I think it might be useful. I agree, I agree with Judge Gleason um, on, on the issue of having professionals such as a case budget analyst come in, the circuit level, the district level. But I think you made an important point, Judge Walton, and I just want to expand on that, that your, your concern about the capacity to educate. Um, Judge Gleason made an interesting notation at the beginning of his testimony uh, that comports with an informal survey I took. Over the years, I was the chair of the Defender Service Advisory Group. Not one judge on the committee asked to be on that committee. Not one. It was someplace judicial careers went to die. <laughs> and, and in fact, many of the persons chosen had, as you noted, Judge Walton, no experience perhaps with the criminal justice system from that perspective, but were prosecutors. And yet, these committees came to, over argument and conflict and tension, came to support and recognize the importance of the defense mission 
And even those committees were ignored by other judges. And their position has been downgraded, as it were. Those committees and the outside monitors and the people we hired as defenders, all of those voices telling a story that today we are still asking, is that true? That is something I would hope the committee would engage in some introspection to understand why the simplicity of that message has not gained traction. I would just um, say that I think it's important. I, I know in our district, voucher cutting is really not an issue from, from what I hear and see. However, I've heard that in other districts over the years it has been. I think that it's important that uh, due process be afforded the CJA lawyer in a voucher cutting situation. The question is what form does that take? Um, I think perhaps there could be a recommendation that each CJA plan requ be required to include a provision for uh, what happens when a voucher is cut and how an attorney challenges it. And then the question is what would be the due process of that CJA attorney if the CJA attorney disagreed with the determination or the, or the cut, uh, a reasonable recommendation might be to establish a committee, just like we have committees to review uh, issues of attorney professional misconduct, uh, a committee made up of various individuals who would review um, the voucher cutting issue um, and make a recommendation. I think that perhaps there's some way to do that to ensure that the due process for the CJA lawyer uh, without making it a complicated appellate process. I think that would be something that would be very important to look at, but I do think that a basic tenet of every CJA plan should be to allow for due process and notice to every attorney and not just in a, in a section that may or may not be adhered to, but as a requirement or as a component of each CJ plan in each, in each district. And then each district can perhaps determine how best to fashion that type of due process review. Judge Walton, can I also suggest that as important as this issue is, I think a bigger problem is not the vouchers that are, that are scrutinized and get cut or not get cut. It's the vouchers that don't get submitted. There are just, there are places there are cultures in our country, criminal justice cultures, where the panel attorneys, this was briefly alluded to yesterday when we talked about the percentage of cases in which support services are sought. There are places where the vouchers don't have to get cut because they're never submitted because the lawyers know. They, they, they know they're not gonna have an investigator approved or these hours some, there are some places where the lawyers know a voucher's never gonna go to the circuit, period. So they don't, they either do the work and it's not compensated or they don't do the work. Um, that's a very important piece of this. It's the, it's the vouchers that, because of cultural imperatives or whether they're imperatives or not, cultural realities, um, there's a felt need not to put yourself in a position where your voucher might get scrutinized. I think that's just as important as the, the universe of cases in which the vouchers are scrutinized and cut. Chip, do you want to ask some questions? I know you've got some sure. familiarity with these issues. Yeah. Um, thanks, Ruben. So um, I want to explore a little bit the role of uh, district judges and circuit judges in the voucher review process. And uh, Judge Williams, since you're one of the very few people in the entire country who's had experience both as a defender and as a judge, I want to ask you some questions about, um, about that role uh, and 
particularly as it relates to other alternatives and specifically the alternative of the defender being responsible for reasonableness reviews. And, and one of the arguments that's been advanced for why it's important for judges to have the role of reviewing those vouchers is because of their <coughs> unique familiarity with the case and that that somehow means that they're in the best position to determine reasonableness in a case. Of course, we also know and we've heard testimony from some defenders who are responsible for doing reasonableness reviews. Uh, and I'm just curious, from your perspective, having served in both capacities as a defender and as a judge, what you think about the role of the, the judge in reviewing that and whether or not their position is so unique that someone else couldn't do as effective a job of a reasonableness review? Well, I first I want to say that I believe, as is appropriate through law, that the court has a, a stewardship responsibility for CJA and, and the budget. But no, I don't believe I occupy any particularly unique position or talent to do voucher review, and I I do not like being put in the position I occupy now as a judge, reviewing a submission by a lawyer who is litigating a matter before me. Um, I certainly am conversant with criminal defense stratagems, and I managed a federal budget for close to, federal defender budget for close to 20 years, but I had personnel assisting me there that a solo practitioner doesn't. And I may know the elements of the case and the defense, but I know nothing about that client. And it was interesting, the very first trial I had, I, I was looking around in my office, I wanted to know where the 302s were and where the statement was, and then I realized, oh no, 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 you, you don't get that. You're an impartial arbiter. You just decide on matters as they are presented to you in trial. So if a CJA lawyer asks to go somewhere to interview a witness, I don't feel comfortable saying, well, you know, if I were defending that case, my choice would be not to interview that witness. That is not my role. People were exquisitely precise during the confirmation process that that is not my role. And so I think there is a genuine and a better alternative in the form of um, case budget analysts or CJA supervising attorneys or circuit budget, whatever you call them, I think those persons hired by the court in consultation with the defender and perhaps um, the private practice lawyer who works in the court and would report ultimately to the court, but who would make the recommendations and make the review, would put added efficiency in the process and integrity because there would be no question as to my as a jurist interfering with the defense of the case. I think defenders reviewing um, CJA vouchers presents real conflict in that, in, at least in this district, defenders are appointed first and then co-defendants afterwards. And so there would be a rare instance where you wouldn't have that relationship amongst the co-defendants. And if I were a defendant, I might look askance at Bob's lawyer telling my lawyer what he or she can't do. So I believe that the proposals in Judge Gleason's uh, testimony, the ones I've touched upon, and others who have appeared before you will, will allow what it is we're all looking for, um, accountable independence. And so I understand, obviously, it would require statutory changes, but do you, are, do you believe that the ultimate decider or the ultimate 
decision maker should remain a judicial officer or do you think that those um, staff individuals that you suggested, the supervisory attorney, the case budgeting attorney, and, and individuals like that should be the final deciders? Realistically, I think if there's going to be any important change, we'd have to start with the latter, that that person was made recommendations to the court and worked with the court. Um, and I don't know that, I mean, I, they are, they are existing now around the country in different capacities that I don't think would require any statutory change, would just require a new attitude on the part of the judiciary in its governance. We could use a clearer standard of review. This is what I thought Professor Kerr was getting at yesterday in asking those questions. You know, is there deference? Is, is it de novo? Do we start from scratch? You know, I've always found a little asymmetrical this notion that when a defense attorney's performance is challenged under Strickland, we engage in all these presumptions of strategic, all this deference. But then the voucher shows up and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, we get second guess de novo every single decision. My own view, never having defended a case, um, is influenced by a belief that what do I know? What do I know about the appropriateness of this? I understand my responsibility and I discharge it, but it's influenced by a degree of deference that I think inheres in the fact that I'm, I'm just a judge. And especially now when 3% of the cases get tried, so much of the work goes on outside my courtroom. So I even feel even not disabled, but more impaired in my ability to second guess. But I think it would be useful to have a, a, a clear standard of review and some, some degree of deference, if you think it's appropriate, built into the uh, review mechanism. And Judge Matthew, I guess I'd just ask sort of a similar question in terms of the role, given your perspective as a CJA panel attorney and, and as a judicial officer as well. I don't think it's appropriate to have the federal defender uh, review vouchers. I think there's too much of an inherent conflict uh, in that situation. I just don't think it is uh, the right way to do it. Um, I, I think that I, I agree with, with uh, what I've heard so far, which there should be some uh, uh, specified guidelines, a specified standard of how to go about it and um, a determination as to who in the first instance makes the determination. Um, I, I think that probably the most reasonable recommendation I would have would be that uh, there be an independent, either, uh, either whether it's a staff attorney or a, or a, or a clerk or, or a CGA administrator, or somebody who makes that initial determination on the voucher uh, and then um, would report to the judiciary, uh, so I think I think it should not be the federal defender. There should be, in the first instance, an independent, or not an independent, but a, a, somebody other than the court reviewing it. And then, if there is any dispute about that, perhaps at that point, going to the <coughs> going to the judiciary. Um, I don't know how that would exactly be structured, but I do I do think that since it seems like this problem is more prevalent in some districts than other districts, that there should be a national standard for this and it should be a requirement to be in each plan, uh, that it's specified as to what the due process is, how the due process is exercised, who makes the review, and where the ultimate challenge goes to, and keeping it from becoming unwieldy where it would be going to, say, an, uh, an appellate court. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think you want that. I think you want something that's more streamlined that can be done fairly quickly in the district. And, and for those of you who advocate the use of supervisory attorneys or CJA case budgeting attorneys or, or other staff individuals like that, would you, would you perceive those individuals to be court employees as they are now? Or would you, and again, we're blue sky in this, but would you see them as being employees uh, who uh, have more of a connection or relationship to the Defender Services? organization or how would you sort of envision that or what, what do you think would be the most appropriate role in that regard 
the model I'm suggesting is just an expansion of, of uh, a position we already have. They're in circuit executive's offices. They perform that function already in the capital and mega cases. They de facto perform these functions already in the second circuit down in, the, in, uh, in smaller cases. So I, I think that model works. It's a court employee. The, in, the uh, input of the defenders and the panel attorneys and who occupies that position I think is important. I mentioned earlier, it's really key who's in the position. And I, and I have less hands-on knowledge of what happened in the sixth and the ninth, the two, the three, the two other <laughs> original pilot courts. Second Circuit, it worked very well, and all the panel attorneys will tell you exactly that. I, I think the question you ask, Mr. Friendsley, is one, it's, on the one hand, it's one of semantics, and on the other hand, it's a radical notion that has defined the tension between indigent defense and the judiciary since the start. I don't think the defenders or CJA lawyers or these budget persons work for judges. They work in the judiciary and they work with the judiciary, but they don't work for them. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a, a notion that many people have difficulty embracing because some think it somehow doesn't acknowledge the judiciary or uh, is trying to diminish some way the judiciary's commitment. I don't think so. I think acknowledging that enhances the judiciary stature and fully demonstrates their commitment to indigent defense. Just a quick point of clarification for me, Judge Williams, given your unique background in this, your ultimate conclusion is who should have the ultimate say? Who signs the voucher that allows the check to be cut? The administrator is discussed by you and Judge Gleason or the judge after review of what the administrator does? I think at some point, Perhaps it should be the administrator. I don't think we, I don't think that point is now. And I think in order to promote the work of the committee to adopt systems already in place, like the ones Judge Gleason um, has spoken of, would be what I would recommend to the, to the committee. If I could just ask Judge uh, Gleason and Judge Williams, both of you have had the opportunity through your work with Defender Services to at least gain some familiarity with uh, the operations of Washington. And there's been uh, a suggestion made by some that uh, uh, Defender Services should be totally separate, a totally separate entity from the judiciary. How do you think such an entity would fare in seeking funding uh, from Congress? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I really think it depends on uh, so, so many things are, I don't mean to be flip, you know that, Reggie, um, but I think it depends on the climate at the time, the, the, who occupies, if you have a defender general, who occupies that position, the precise apparatus that's set up. I've thought about this a lot. When I was chair of defender services, the defenders didn't like this one bit. You know, I, I thought we kept running into these built-in conflicts. And I devoted part of one of our committee meetings to, to step back and look at this structurally. I invited Kathleen Sullivan to come and give us readings. We had like a little law school course. And uh, defenders didn't want any of this. But um, I think it's a fascinating question. I don't accept the notion for a moment that necessarily there's gonna be like a defunding of the defense, defense function. Do I understand the risks? I understand the protection that they feel being embedded within the judiciary, of course. But I don't think it's a foregone conclusion at all that a independent structure, completely independent structure, would spell the doom of the uh, defenders from a fiscal point of view. Uh, having said that, here's the Brady material I'll give you. Um, we invited in, there's some, other, there's some states that have done just that, created defenders general. 
who make their own independent budget requests, separate budget requests to the legislature. And for the most part, they got clobbered. They weren't funded well. But um, I still don't believe that that would necessarily be the case. I think it's a really interesting question. It'd be fun to see it happen. <laughs> Ms. Williams, sorry. I don't, I can't speak for the defenders today, obviously, but when I was the chair of the defenders, I was um, ever fearful of being separated out of the judiciary, and I was mindful of all the instances, the states, legal aid, that were defunded um, in their standalone position. And what I said to the committee at a meeting here in South Florida years and years ago was that the defenders did not want a divorce, but we did want counseling. And I think that is what this committee hopefully is about. Um, I don't know at this juncture whether indigent defense is ready to be divorced from the protection of the federal judiciary, um, but I think there needs to be this dialogue and discussion and reflection, and, and I'm hoping that will enhance the position of Defender Services, perhaps a discussion to reinstate them to the stature they once held, and the committee to the responsibilities it had in terms of governance. So we've got, oh, just, uh, just I'm sorry. one, just to go in, in another direction, because I think the focus has been about maybe vouchers, but the process of selecting the head of the office, the public defender, it's still the courts and the judges select, the circuit court. And, in, and we have not heard, we've had a few stories about judges getting interfered out about who's gonna run the office, but the process that's in place of allowing the circuit to appoint and it being a four-year term, do you have any concerns about how public defenders are selected. I know community defenders are different. They have their own independent boards. But with regard to how the public defender head of the office is selected, do you think that system is working and functioning, or do you think it needs to be tweaked in any way? I have views, but I'm speaking too much. Let me defer to my colleagues first. Well, I don't have specific views. So far, the system that has been in place, the circuit has consulted and has taken into consideration the district court views or recommendations. I think that has to be factored in, as it must be factored in the, the, the community, the culture, the, the district that it serves as well. Any particular needs should be uh, considered. Uh, probably what has happened, and, and Probably I, I see more eye to eye with the approach that was described yesterday here by public defender McNamara, uh, in which there was great communication, and, and that's what I aspire, between uh, panel, public defenders, and, and the court. I don't see why that will certainly infringe upon respect of each one's independence and the roles and the work they do. But lately, um, and maybe within the last seven years or something like that. It's kind of a different culture than one that is being developed. Uh, to some extent, when the circuit is the one that appoints, uh, there has been some ill misconception in the sense that the public defender may think that the views of the district court or the community that it serves in terms of the type of case structure, case assignment, even if it's defined on a plan, that they are not necessarily to be taking that into consideration. Uh, years ago, I, I am not saying this is currently, years ago. Uh, I got the public defender telling me I don't serve the district court. And I don't say, well, it, you're not an employee of the district court, you don't serve in the sense that you're not a servant, but that you do provide a service to the district that the court serves as well, and you have to take into consideration some matters that affects the way in which cases are managed here and, and court schedule and other administrative matters. Yes, you have to. Uh, so, but to a large extent, Right now, uh, I don't have any uh, adverse comments uh, to that, except that uh, the, the position or, or the views of the district court be factored in and those of the community as well. They should all be CDOs, in my view. The, uh, 
I respectfully disagree with the comments made yesterday by one of our brother judges from North Carolina who suggested that CDOs are not more independent. They're, they're more independent. They, they're appointed, the executive director is appointed by a board. And the fact of the matter is, this is another built-in conflict, obviously, even, even when you go to the places with the best, most vigorous defenders, um, if you go there at the right time of the cycle, they'll, you'll hear in conversation, um, I'm up for reappointment. As a, sometimes it's joking, but it's, a, it's a, the notion that the judges before whom the defender and, the, and her assistants practice law um, have a say in whether the defender, have a say through the circuit chief. Um, that matters. It's a, it is a break on their independence. It's not the biggest break in the world. I don't think there's, there's not a, a large number of uh, cases analogous to the one you heard so much testimony about yesterday. But it's a built-in break. And the community defenders, we have a community defender in New York, answers to a board of directors. They chose that deliberately when we took them out of legal aid, precisely for that reason, to have greater independence from the judges. We've got little time left. I wanted to give both our reporter and the other committee members a chance to ask some questions because it's been a helpful panel. Judge Cardone. Uh, I, I just, uh, I have a question of Chief Judge Delgado, and that is you cited a number of statistics um, in your opening, and I was just wondering for purposes of the committee whether or not you'd be willing to provide, I think you did in your, your statement, but if we need, you know, we believe in dealing in facts, um, if you can, if we need sort of the background to that and those Absolutely. statistics. It, do you have any problems with providing Absolutely those? Absolutely, no. I'll, I'll be pleased to submit the statistics that you request. All right, and then I just have one other follow-up, and, and it's back to vouchers, but in preparation um, for these hearings, our, our attorneys, um, our research uh, attorneys do a good job of getting us as much information as they can, and uh, we were talking about vouchers, and um, I noticed in the District of Puerto Rico, and I'm only going to use that as an example um, because um, uh, we have uh, the chief judge from there, but I'd, I'd address this question just generally to everybody. Um, there are some standing orders about submitting vouchers in the uh, in the district, and one of the um, standing orders says uh, for services rendered, entries such as interview with client, read and analyzed order, and prepared motion are vague and unacceptable. Entries shall include the purpose, the topic, the title of the order or motion, specific person with whom the conversation or interview was held, and whether whatever detail, whatever other detail you deem necessary for the court to evaluate the entry. And um, that's just one example. I guess my concern, um, it, you know, because we've been talking about, I heard yesterday someone mention, you know, judges do um, reviews for acceptable attorney's fees all the time in civil matters. These are ongoing cases. And um, when I have interim vouchers uh, and I'm trying, you know, a, a, a gang case or a 36 defendant case and I'm trying to decide reasonableness, um, I'm uncomfortable with having to review some of these very specific details in order to determine whether or not uh, I'm going to pay these. Um, we talk about inherent conflicts and we talk about maybe having the circuit review these or circuit executive review these. But the, but the issue still becomes that we're looking at work that's being performed by an attorney, especially in an interim voucher. Um, should the judges have a role? I, I, I mean, I'm just really trying to understand how we balance because, you know, you talked about the conflict that the defenders may have. How do I not have a conflict when I'm looking at these very detailed specifics about what an attorney is doing in one of my cases? Any response? I can understand where, let me put this in a context because you read and referred to a, a, a description or an example that was given in my district. And let me begin by saying that technically interim vouchers are not largely, have not been largely adopted. For example, in multi-defendant cases, uh, if it's perceived that it's going to last for 
a long period of time. Yes, some judges have approved interim vouchers. Most, when approving interim vouchers, will pay upfront for trial time so that the attorney keeps receiving uh, some, some income while the case is ongoing and is on trial. And during pretrial stages, if the case has taken too long, maybe uh, vouchers have been approved for six months. There was once a judge that approved monthly vouchers, and all of a sudden he was swamped in reviewing vouchers, and aside from dealing with the legal issues of the case, and he modified uh, the order. But yes, were details like those that you suggest to be given, probably there would be a conflict. But we basically, what is being requested, if the research is on multiplicity of conspiracies, it's just a broad general uh, statement, not much different from the information that I may get on a status conference that I frequently hold in multi-defendant cases, where I get, give every defense attorney to give me an idea, aside from the case management order that's specifically drafted for those type of cases to expedite the discovery and the exchange of information. But in those conferences, I ask every attorney to give me what are the hurdles that you are confronting so that I can issue an order to expedite the discovery process or to uh, help to reach a solution with the U.S. attorney in order to move on. Uh, and that's when I learned about complexities with the defendant, how difficult it is, or the need to involve relatives because of the defendant's uh, some mild mental competency or, or mental retardation that may exist, problems of communications, needs for experts, all of that is addressed during the status conference. I don't think that with that, what's meant to ask for uh, information that I will turn to be privy of things that I should know during a pretrial stage of the case. And still we are talking in a district in which not necessarily uh, a large number of interim vouchers or frequent interim vouchers are, are approved. So, but the possibility may, may exist. What we are trying to avoid and sometimes we see is that sometimes we see vouchers in which the attorney says every time he's going to MDC to interview, review entire case file, summarize entire case file. If you need to do that every month or every two weeks when you go to the institution, it doesn't sound reasonable. Then, of course, probably there will be a flag and there will be a questioning of the attorney as to why that is needed. Uh, and then that sort of things. And sometimes they say research, and you look at the docket, and there's no one single motion being filed. So at least give me an idea of something that didn't result. So if it's ratification of, of conduct by juvenile, that's all I need. So I'm not demanding detailed or specific information. Judge Cardone, I, I agree with you in terms of I, the level of discomfort I have with ongoing litigation and reviewing vouchers and any granular detail, and as Judge Gleason said, who, who am I? I don't know what's going on outside of the courtroom. I don't know what kind of negotiations are going on with the U.S. Attorney's Office. I certainly don't know what monies the U.S. Attorney's Office have been provided in the prosecution of this case and what it is a defense attorney may need for a particular client. And that's why I find the analogy to our review of civil matters to be not quite uh, persuasive. So for example, in an FLSA case, it comes to us at settlement. The parties have agreed. The reason we are asked to review is because we want to make sure there's been no collusive activity to deprive that individual of what is just and right and due. But two lawyers in this community have agreed market rates 350 and higher should be awarded for the work. I can think of any number of CJA lawyers that would say, yes, I'd like to do that. I would like to go for market rates at the end of the case, and then you tell me if you think that was appropriate. But it, it, it's apples and it's oranges. Um, and I, I think having uh, a Criminal Justice Act review lawyer to do that as the case is ongoing gives efficiency, gives integrity, and allows, this is a business. The CJA component of the judiciary budget is, as we were told time and again, the fastest growing and the largest component part next to judges and uh, staff salaries. Any business of this size would have CEOs um, and regional managers. So it, it, it's not radical to think that we too, in our governance of the program, should have such persons. Okay. I think 
Judge Gleason had to oh, say. Sorry. Three quick points. One is we actually use, and I understand it not, isn't necessarily importable everywhere because New York is New York and everybody's right there. But uh, we actually use the case <coughs> budgeting specialist for precisely that purpose, even in non-mega cases. To you have a interim voucher, you don't want to second guess what's going on. <coughs> have them take a look, see whether this is within the bounds of reasonableness. So it might be a useful tool in that setting. Second, I think this implicates the degree of deference issue. You know, it strikes me those questions uh, suggest. <coughs> A, uh, a level of scrutiny that might not be appropriate to the occasion, even if judges review the voucher. And third, and this is more, more abstract, you know, in those interim voucher cases, I bet those people are facing decades in, in prison or the rest of their life in prison. And I mentioned this in my written testimony. You know, I found out by accident that the government was paying a prison guard who was facing a very small amount of damages. They had there's a conflict of some sort. They're paying outside counsel to represent a prison guard in a Bivens action, two hundred fifty dollars an hour. And like, what are we doing? Why are we going over with a fine tooth comb these expenditures when we're appointing someone to represent an individual who's going to spend the rest of his life in prison? He's convicted. Honest to goodness, I, I don't really get it. I don't get. And I think part of it is, you know, we get into tight budget times. I mentioned this as well in my written testimony. We get into tight budget times. Everybody knows we're in tight budget times. Things are tough or te sequestration is coming. There's really only one thing a district judge can do to save money. Can't do anything about our clerk's salary or the clerk's office or probation. We can cut vouchers. I think that needs to be addressed at, at uh, kind of overarching the atmospherics of voucher review or such that it's, uh, it cuts a very poor, uh, it, it places the panel attorneys in a very poor situation. Yeah, I think we've got time for a quick question. Thank you. Uh, Chief Judge Delgado, I wanted to ask you a question about the multi-defendant cases that you have in your district. You indicated that in Puerto Rico, you're the number one district for multi-defendant cases. Or among think, those. Excuse me? Or among those, yes, with right. the highest number, yes. All right, so my question is, obviously you were an attorney before you became a judge, and now as a judge, you certainly know that, let's say there are 10 people involved in a multi-defendant case, there are folks involved in that case who have very different criminal responsibility, and so their attorneys are representing them, uh, are representing very different people and have different responsibilities in that representation. We've heard about a concept of averaging in voucher review, in that when the attorneys put their vouchers in, the judges collect the vouchers, if they can, as many as they can, before they make a decision about the payment. And in collecting them, they then take the average and decide that that's the appropriate amount to pay. And then the folks who are above the average get reduced. Unclear is folks who are below the average get increased, but I don't think that's happening. Uh, but folks who are above the average get reduced. Obviously, that's not, well, let me say this. It seems that that's not what was intended when um, attorneys are required to present the work in their voucher at the hourly rate of now $129 an hour. Can you tell me if you're aware of this practice in your district? I know you had referenced it earlier in your testimony. And is that something that you consider to be acceptable? Well, let me put it this way. Let me clarify. First of all, the averaging not necessarily has the purpose of taking the voucher to an amount below the maximum cap. Sometimes you use as the, the model of the, of the cross-reference a voucher that is still above the, the maximum amount. That's the first thing. So it's not necessarily to bring it to the 10,000 that is now or 9,800 9, that was before. So, uh, and first of all, the and next thing is, the averaging and the cutting of hours, if any, does not occur necessarily on the time of effort that the attorney puts in, like investigation hours or things. Sometimes it's placed on uh, uh, where I have seen that. 
in amount of discovery, where you may have that, the, and, and usually the judge takes the highest uh, billing time from all those other attorneys. Let's say, for example, purposes it's 35, and then you get this attorney with 70 hours in reviewing that same package of discovery. You ask the attorney, why is this? Is, is there any discrepancy or any differences? And you will have, in terms of the practice and how it follows that in multi-defendant cases, the U.S. attorney will give a general package of discovery that involves the discovery as to everyone. Then they will identify for you where your client is and what is the concise evidence that is against your client and who the cooperators as to your client is. Same information that we try to elicit during the status conferences. More so if you are one of the very few as to which there is only testimonial evidence, the court tries to get all of that evidence beforehand to put you in a position to assist your client to make a decision. But when we get to the average thing is usually where I have seen it, it's there with the amount of time reviewing the discovery. Some attorneys have placed the, the billing for the time that appears on that video, even if the camera is just going up and down where the, the informant is traveling on a bicycle to the drug point. And then it gets to the transaction that probably will last a couple of minutes. And technically that is being told. And I can understand an attorney telling me I need to review everything for a just in case. Uh, but still, there are attorneys who have done that and are not billing that type of time. And besides, as I said, it's a minimum. I see the same attorneys coming up in that list, I'll say less than five, and, and which are the, the other billers in that sense. Averaging, I repeat what I said, is I'll say it's to a minimum. Perhaps there might be an issue with a given judge. I know that recently there's one case that I'll consider to be in the, that small group, but it's causing a lot of noise, but that is not the, the practice nor the norm, that, or, nor what I consider to be proper. So averaging, when I mentioned judicial adjustments of an 8%, though averaging is in there, vouchers cuts is in there. I can say that's a pervasive problem. Can I just ask you another question about that? I understand that from your perspective, it may not be a pervasive problem. Even 8% may be to the attorneys. I'm talking for my district. I, I'm I, sorry? I can't, I can't talk for other districts. No, I'm only, spoken, I'm only speaking about yours, ma'am. Okay. My question is this. It may not seem a lot 8% to you, but of course to the person whose voucher gets cut, mm -hmm. it will seem mm -hmm. significant, especially if the voucher is halved, which is um, one of the one I'm speaking mm -hmm. of. But more importantly, it seems well, it seems unusual that the attorneys, at least the CJA rep who we have received testimony from, indicates that vouchers are often cut, in fact said almost always cut, and the, the information that you provided to us today is that statistically you believe it's only in 8% of the cases based on the information that you've pre presented. Can you explain in any way the disparity of the perception of the CJA attorneys in your district that the vouchers are cut often, almost always, and you, the disparity between that and the 8%? I will just say, get the statistics. Uh, as a member of the CJA panel committee, we, on the reappointment process, one of the stages is to interview the attorneys. We seldom get that type of complaints. Uh, and sometimes, and way back even more, uh, we got some complaints about delays in voucher review. And as I said, uh, there was a time in which we had a huge increment in the vouchers and the staffing was uh, reduced in order to do that initial screening to get the vouchers to the judges, and we have worked hard to improve that situation. But we don't get the frequency that is being voiced or that you may hear it's being uh, uh, presented. I think you have representations here of a vocal minority and that sometimes uh, if the perception of the defenders is that there should be a change in the way vouchers are reviewed, that that's just an instrument that is being used to, to put forth uh, that type of request. But certainly the, this committee can ask any district court for any given period of time uh, going back to check on those statistics and report and be able to evaluate uh, whether that given district has that type of problem or not. And I won't have a problem in having mine evaluated as to that. I, I remain confident that it's not a pervasive problem. And that actually I think that will be solved if clear guidelines are set and uniformity is promoted and judges are uh, guided and taught on how to apply those guidelines and we can seek more uniformity. 
uh, as a chief judge. I can't say that there have not been times in which I have gone to a district judge uh, after talking to an attorney or after an attorney approached me on, on comments on a given voucher, and I have talked that judge into being more reasonable. Uh, but as to a pervasive problem, no. Well, let me just ask one thing, and this isn't a question. It's just a follow-up, and that is um, I noticed that both in your testimony, uh, your written testimony and your oral testimony today, that the 8% figure that you gave us didn't have any time period associated with it. So when you March, provide that November information. March, 2015. Right. Uh, it's I saw that time period as to another voucher reference. but So let me just say that when you give us the, the information that Judge Cardone requested, I would just ask that you have a specific time period. Very well. Thank you. I think we're <coughs> over time, so unless the committee wants to run into the next one. I um, I know our reporter had at least one cleanup question he needed to ask them, so if we can do yes, that. Thank you. So this is directed to Judge Gleason, although if the rest of you would like to chime in, please go ahead. Uh, I was, um, was surprised and, and frankly a little disappointed in one of the opening pieces of the, um, the written testimony that you provided to the committee where you said you thought a great deal about the appropriate structure for the provision of Well, I was hoping to make it back, John. <laughs> I think there should be fundamental structural change. I, I, I think the uh, resting the, uh, the obligation, the responsibility to deliver indigent defense away from the judiciary is a good idea. We've just gotten used to the fact that it's um, in the judiciary. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I'm not sure if we had a blank slate and we were divvying up responsibilities now and that was on the table, we would take it. So I would take it all out of the judiciary and, and uh, find a really good defender general. Didn't, didn't you, uh, you were head of a committee that came to a different conclusion? My memory right or well, we were asked as part of cost containment to uh, to look into this and, and address a number of suggestions. And the short answer to your question is yes. And we're over time, and I'm happy to take us through the long answer to this question. But one fulcrum of that decision was a representation from the budget committee that we accepted, and that is that having the Defender program as part of the judiciary had no impact on the defender program budget. That is to say, it was not the case that a dollar into the defender budget was perceived as a, a dollar out of the other other spending programs. I don't think that's true anymore. I don't think it was true then, but we accepted it as true. Does that answer your question, <coughs> Judge Goldner? A little bit, but we can talk. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I think we need to wrap it up. As I said, this has been a very helpful panel and my thanks and the committee's thanks to all of you for the time you've given to this.